We went to Lebanon in the midst of the fighting over there once. The, um, the Palestinians at the UN made the arrangements uh, for us to go, and we went without knowing where we would do the program for security reasons. They wouldn't tell us. We had said we won't wait more than three days, though, because reporters had been going over to interview him and spending five days sitting around waiting before they ever got to see him. But they said, okay, three days. And we also asked for two choices in locations to be sure we had an adequate place. So after we, and they had to help us through security at the airport. They were really controlling everything. And we had to go in cars they controlled. It was a very dangerous time in, in Beirut. There was a, an NBC bureau chief of sorts there uh, who was a, a, a I think he'd been a, a professor. He was very helpful. And then there was a sort of fixer, fixer there. But there were no, uh, we had brought in a correspondent from someplace else. And uh, Washington Post one, I believe, from Cairo. And um, we had put together the panel from different places. But anyway, we were pretty dependent on the PLO to, to uh, get around the city. And they, uh, the second night, I guess, they said that we could see the two places to choose from, but only two people can come. So we sent the two top technical people of course. We had taken, I believe, 11 people and like 15 crates of equipment because there was nothing there that we could use otherwise except for, well, I, we had picked up a camera crew from Cairo, I believe, at least one. and. So we sent the two top technical people, and they accepted the first apartment they saw, which was a, in a, a moderately nice neighborhood uh, on, on the fifth floor of a, an apartment building. And so the they said, we'll pick you up the next morning, the crew at a certain time, and they were coming back for Bill Monroe and me later. And But we never had the address, any of us, maybe, we should have somehow gotten it, but we didn't. But they took the crew off, and then Bill and I eventually found this guy waiting for us in a car, and we got in, starting off, and got in the midst of the worst traffic jam I've ever been in, in the midst of uh, Beirut, which once, I'm sure, was a lovely town, but was a real mess at that point. Much of it had been burned out by the fighting. But the driver just got so stuck there was he couldn't go forward, so he started backing backwards down a hill. It was at haunt, constant honking, just all the time, and we just you know sort of cringed. And but he got out of it somehow and went around, went another route, got to this apartment building, which of course we had never seen, and he did not speak in English. He let us out and he held up five fingers. So we figured the fifth floor, uh, I don't think that they had really told us that the night before. But anyway, we went up and as soon as we got off the elevator, we saw the cables which we followed to the apartment and uh, they had everything set up. There was a woman uh, who lived there apparently and a small boy, cute boy, about 10 years old. And she was passing orange juice and cookies throughout the the time to us. Uh, Arafat was about two hours later than we expected coming, but he did arrive and I guess had been in the mountains because it was quite warm in Beirut. And he came in wearing a fur hat and a padded jacket and behind him was somebody with a pillow that had his, uh, uh, I've forgotten the name of it, but the headdress that he normally wears, the black and white checkered. Oh, yeah. Kafia, yes. And so he went into the bedroom and changed and came out with that on and a, a uniform of sorts. He was very pleasant, no, no difficulties with him. His people had AK-47s. Uh, they shuttered all the windows and stood with the guns all around the room while this woman kept passing cookies and orange juice and we taped the program. And it was videotaped then. We had to stop in the midst of it, though, to change tapes. I think at that point we only had 20-minute tapes. And uh, 
But I, I can remember, I, was, I had brought a little tape recorder and was making my own audio tape so I could take it home uh, to rush the help the guy making the transcript. And I just sat looking around the room at the, the machine guns and the orange juice and the cookies and I thought, what a strange world we live in. But we had also walked around the, the streets a little bit. There were garbage, there was garbage stacked up higher than, than the ceiling uh, in most rooms. There were, we went into one, the main, one of the main modern hotels, which was just burned to a shell, but the escalator was still there and seemed to be stable. The correspondent, uh, when the correspondents took us there, and we climbed up the escalator and went into an atrium, which had obviously had a lot of beautiful plants and things, all of which had been burned. It was just the, and there were wild cats running around. The eeriest feeling to see all of this. And uh, Beirut, of course, is on the water and it's near the mountains and everyone who knew it in the early days says it really was the Paris of the Middle East. And I hope it will be a beautiful city again because it is a wonderful location. What about Arafat himself? He, just very pleasant, very cooperative. At the end of it, there were again, like 15 men and me um, in the room, and he came out with a, a little present for me as the only female, and it was a, a cotton shirt, it was black, with a lot of uh, nice embroidery on it, which had been made in a refugee camp, and I felt it, I should take it. It was after the interview was over, and I did not want to uh, insult him, and I took it. It was actually too big for me. At that time, I think I probably grew into it, but I've never really worn it. It's not the sort of thing I got, but it's interesting to have.